I'm a latecomer to this conference, and so I will try to keep any remarks brief. But I am Robert Moser. I am the chair of the government department. And so I am very happy to be at least uh, a part of this uh, session here on uh, the new book coming out uh, the, uh, by Jason, Andy, and uh, Tarek. And uh, I welcome you from the government department and also our commentators for this session and uh, appreciate all of you for uh, coming on this cold day. This is cold for Austin standards. And I will uh, kind of leave it up to you guys to, to start the discussion going. So. I, 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 whatever you guys Melanie. Yes, Melanie will go first. All right, yeah. I am following alphabetical. Okay, can everybody hear me, or do I need to use a microphone? I think maybe there is a microphone on. Okay, because I'm hearing my echo. Um, okay, so let me just. Okay. Uh, well, thank you very much for including me in this panel. I'm really delighted to be here, besides, uh, apart from the fact that the weather does not feel that different from Boston and I'm freezing. Um, but, but it's really great to be here and, um, and to be part of this. I'm very much looking forward to the book and getting my signed copy. Um, and I, I really genuinely have great things to say about this book, not just because it's a book launch and you're supposed to say great things about a book under those conditions, but because honestly, I'm, I really am convinced by much of the argument and very sympathetic to it. I think it's going to be an incredibly important book that's going to be widely read. It might actually, I think it actually will be one of those books that is read by non-academics. You might even find it in airports. And, um, and it'll be great for teaching. Um, we will, of course, cite you when we when we teach this book, um, and and I think it is, you know, really w one of the most systematic and analytically rigorous uh, cuts into the Arab Spring or uprisings that I'm certainly aware of, and um, and I think the authors are very meticulous about their approach here. They say at the outset that they're aiming to build theory, not to test theory. And they're very careful and explicit about what the book does and does not do. And these are, are great strengths from a scholarly perspective, also from a policy and more general interest perspective. Um, so you, you have a good sense of what the book is about. Um, and you see that even the process of defining the questions they seek to answer is a careful analytical exercise. So there's the two main questions that motivate the first and the second half of the book, respectively, about why you see leadership change in some cases but not others, and then why we see varied trajectories post-uprisings in countries that did experience this change. Uh, and, and I think they do a very good job of handling uh, this difficult question of the moving target. Because as, as all the authors pointed out, this is an evolving set of events. And some people would make the argument that it's not over. Uh, and they do ver a very good job of uh, defining exactly what it is they're trying to explain and in what time periods those take place. So the leadership change between 20, 2010 and 2012, the institutional change 2011 to 2013. So, uh, so that's very carefully spe uh, specified. Um, and, and the the case selection is well justified of the 14 Arab countries that are covered. Uh, even a very good argument about why uh, it is important to treat the Arab region as a region, uh, but not at the same time as a sort of sui generis, unique part of the world that can't generate lessons for other parts of the world. And I will talk about what some of those lessons are shortly. Uh, one of the many things that I admire about the book is the, the careful attention to conceptualization and then measurement of the variables. Um, you've seen this with their treatment of authoritarian breakdown and the, uh, the, the how do you pronounce this acronym, FIRC, um, foreign imposed regime change. Uh, I love that one. Um, so in general, I, I really find the arguments convincing. So as you've seen on the first part of the book, the uh, question of authoritarian breakdown or crackdown, uh, the two key variables are the extent of oil rents, uh, and the nature of the ruling elite and whether the ruler came to power through hereditary succession. Um, so, uh, you know, the first indicator I think is quite clear. I'm convinced by it, uh, the oil rents indicator. Um, 
And, and, and uh, in general, I, I, I should also say that, uh, as, as you saw from the presentation, they're very careful to specify the conditions under which different combinations of these variables lead to their outcomes. So you need both of them to have a certain value in order to have authoritarian breakdown. And then in the other instance, uh, you need one as a sufficient variable. So I, I like the careful attention to causality in, in tracing the effects of these variables. Um, so turning to the second variable, hereditary rule, this is a one that for a while has been less obvious to me, uh, but I think they do a very good job of elaborating the logic of the argument and certainly playing it out in the detailed case studies. Um, so, so as the authors articulate, hereditary succession matters because it commands greater loyalty among the security forces and therefore the regime is able to repress. Effectively, I think you can push it even further and say that uh, hereditary rule provides a certain amount of certainty to political elites that then uh, makes them more likely to throw their weight behind the incumbent ruler uh, because you know this is a cost-benefit analysis and a sort of risk assessment if you're thinking about whether to remain with the incumbent or defect. And so there's something nice about hereditary rule that seems to sort of signal more certainty in the durability of the leadership. Um, but I think also this, the, the question of hereditary rule can actually be pushed further in this book because there are some questions that are, ra that are raised for me at least. Um, and, and I hate to get into this infinite regress uh, exercise, but I think these questions actually really matter for the strength of the argument. Um, and, and so the question that arises for me is, um, you know, why is it that some rulers, especially in non-monarchies where it's a little bit less obvious, like Syria, why is it that they're able to pull this off? Because I expect that a lot of rulers would like to pull this off, but not everybody can pull it off. And it's, again, especially interesting in the non-monarchy case of Syria. Um, so why was it that Assad was able to bring the military and, and, and economic elite, actually, I think it's more than the military here that matters, also the economic elite, on board to his dynastic project? Well, say Mubarak was not. Um, why was it that Saleh was less able to secure hereditary rule despite his best efforts? There's some answer uh, when you read the Yemeni case material there provided by one of the Yemen experts that they quote about the need to um, uh, have an inclusive approach to accommodate the diverse tribes and groups that were key to stability in Yemen. But why is this the case in Yemen, but not elsewhere? Yemen is certainly not the only place that had diverse groups, right, that had to be brought in, theoretically. Um, and so in the analyses, they start to provide an answer to this question. Um, I think they, they argue that prior material and institutional patterns explain why coercive forces stuck with the regime. So I would, I'm you know, really interested, I think this is an important question, what are those forces exactly? Um, and when you read through the excellent case material in the Syrian case, for example, it seems to be something about ethno-sectarian cleavages and, um, and their um, <clears throat> incentives for um, for, for um, providing, uh, you know, for having elites, especially minorities and Alawis, rally around the Assad family. Um, but then there's additional questions about why is it that some of the Sunni elites actually are fully on board with the Assad regime and to this day remain with them. Um, and then another, you know, little question that we might want to think about is, yes, Assad is in power. He was not ousted. However, he's lost a whole bunch of his territory. So there's another sort of little pattern there, which is you know, retaining power, but not over the national territory that you once ruled. Um, and, and, you know, and this is a moving target. Um, and, and foreign factors definitely are starting to come into play there as well. I don't know if we're going to get a full-blown FIRC there, but something's going on there. Um, so, uh, so turning to the second question about successful transitions to democracies, uh, which um, you know, very convincingly the authors point out has only occurred in Tunisia, um, we saw the variables at play there, the strong state and the sufficient degree of pluralism among pro-democratic forces. Um, again, I really appreciate the thorough approach, the methodical approach, both in coding the cases and generating explanations. Um, and, and 
Another uh, hallmark of the book that I think is very strong and distinguishes it from other uh, publications out there uh, that are already out there and I expect will be out there in the future is the, the attention to potential endogeneity and tautology in the logic of argument. So, so you know, what conditions are associated with create, um, complete transitions, the strength of the opposition, but the authors don't just leave it there. We want to know why is it that the opposition is strong and what are these characteristics of opposition forces and why is it that some are more tolerant of pluralism and others aren't? I think these are excellent questions. They're sort of the holy grail questions, as, uh, in fact, and too many of us sort of make those claims, but then don't probe more deeply about why is it that the Tunisian opposition and political landscape looks this way, which is you know, an incredibly important question. Um, so, uh, so they bring in, uh, you know, they provide an answer, which we've just seen, uh, and, and I think a, you know, a compelling one that's definitely gonna generate a lot more research. Um, and, and, and this is the, uh, the, the origins of civil society, which they link back to classic uh, uh, structural variables uh, related to the pattern of economic development. So we saw in, in, uh, in the Egyptian case, you have a weak civil society that gets dominated by Islamists and non-Islamists withdraw from the democratic process and quite a different uh, 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 sequence of events plays out in Tunisia where you have a strong civil society, especially the strong labor movement that I think uh, scholars are increasingly pointing to um, in, in work coming out on Tunisia. And, and therefore, non-Islamists did not feel compelled to withdraw from the democratic game. Um, and, and again, the, link, the, the explanation here has a lot to do with uh, structural variables, industrialization, and that sort of thing. I think you might actually want to think also about colonial legacies there. And, and this is another thing I appreciate about the book is it's kind of pushing the colonial legacies argument, uh, admittedly preliminarily, because you can't do everything in great detail in one book, but I like that some of the arguments go back to the colonial era to look at the origins of uh, you know, military strength in Egypt, for example. And here's another place that we might look for colonial legacies, which is the influence of the French uh, labor movement. That was really influential in North Africa and certainly in the Tunisian case. Um, and Tunisians were part of French labor unions, learned about trade and union practices there, and brought them back into Tunisia. And there's some interesting work by uh, Tunisian and French scholars on this. Uh, so, so I know I'm going on for a while, uh, but I do want to uh, make a, a, some general points about the analytical contributions, which are many. Uh, and I, 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 I applaud the fact that this book moves beyond less historically grounded and more proximate accounts uh, that we see all over the place. Uh, and, and that's, again, uh, this effort to sort of probe these more proximate variables and understand where, there's co where they're coming from is really important. Uh, it's really important methodologically because if you just simply state, oh, Tunisia is more pluralist or has you know, this um, a weaker military, this really does beg the question methodologically of where those key variables come from. Um, and um, and uh, certainly the account engages with existing literature on the region, especially the work on monarchism and oil rontierism. And what's nice is they're very nuanced about this because there are some well-known critiques of some of the rentier state literature out there, especially its linkages to economic development and its linkages to authoritarianism. But they're very precise in saying what oil does here analytically. And they say it's really about regime stability, about maintaining regime regime stability. Um, they also do a nice job of refuting potential rival hypotheses, the youth bulge argument, uh, you know, showing that um, there's, there's no real cross-country variation that maps onto the uprising versus non-uprising countries. They might also note that there was an ILO report that came out a year or two ago showing that the youth bulge actually peaked in the 70s in North Africa and in the early 90s in uh, the Mushrek. So, you know, that's another argument against the youth Youth bulge claim. Um, uh, the, the technology social media argument, which was getting really tiresome. I'm glad you guys have 
dispensed with that effectively um, while doing you know, proper homage to the people that took risks and used uh, social media, the role of the military, um, and, uh, and, and also just the detailed and theoretically informed case studies are an incredible resource here. They're not just sort of lists of this happened and this happened and this happened. They're very well structured case studies, which brings me to my next point that I think this book actually makes an important methodological contribution uh, as a model of good qualitative research. And we don't have a lot of that getting celebrated in our discipline of political science these days. And I think this is a good example of how uh, being really rigorous about concepts and indicators and causal processes and thinking consistently about refuting rival hypotheses is a very strong way to approach research. Um, and they also engage uh, briefly with some of these larger methodological debates about you know, the negative degrees of freedom problem, and they show us how their approach to process tracing addresses that. And the case studies are very strong. I think I, I buy that. Um, the, the book clearly speaks to broader literatures beyond Middle East focused literatures in the social sciences, in political science, uh, on democratization and durable authoritarianism. It's situated in a larger set of historical cases and we there's some nice dialogue with uh, moments of protest in other parts of the world. Um, and fruitfully builds on the literature on democratic transitions. Also, I think it's nice uh, the way the book uh, relates to literature on democracy and development uh, in addressing the origins of civil society. Um, some of it, you know, they, they do invoke some of the classic modernization theorists like Lipset, also Ruschemeyer Stevens and Stevens on the role of labor in, uh, cap, uh, and in democratic transitions, which of course is an important variable here. Uh, and I think it's nice that we see this emphasis on labor because labor has been sort of neglected for a while in studies of the Middle East and it clearly was an important actor uh, in these events. Um, also, some of these arguments relate to, in a kind of inverse way, to what Michael Ross has called the modernization effect in the oil authoritarianism debates. So one of his mechanisms for explaining the apparent linkage between oil and authoritarianism is this you know, lack of modernization in oil rich countries. And so this is kind of flipping that argument on its head and showing how that might play in shaping civil society here. Um, and, and I just wanna end by saying that uh, the, the book also makes some provocative claims that uh, deserve um, some more attention in the broader literature. One is this claim about the relationship between um, personalism and, um, and, um, and authoritarian durability, this curvilinear relationship that they've potentially identified and throw out there. I think that's quite provocative. Also, FIRC you know, foreign imposed regime change as a form of agency. That's, a, that's quite a provocative claim out there, but you know, it is a form of agency and it has really tangible effects on the ground. Um, and, and I think at the same time, and this gets at one of the questions earlier about, well, isn't something different in the region as a result of all these uprisings or is it just, you know, hit the reset button, nothing's changed. And I think they leave the door open for incremental change. Um, they, you know, they put it out there. I mean, they're, you know, nobody is claiming to be an absolute wizard here in predicting the future. Uh, and so it is possible that things will happen incrementally. And I, I think actually, Actually, if we move beyond, and this is not the purpose of this book, and I'm not faulting the authors for not addressing this, if we move beyond regime change and democratic transitions, we might actually see some real tangible changes in the region, and I think we have already. It's, it's already been, uh, you know, there have been some important changes in Morocco, for example, in the health regime that uh, policymakers have claimed are a direct result of protests that occurred in Morocco. So there may be other realms of political and social life where there are changes that are not sort of radically destabilizing and don't affect the fundamental foundations of the regime, but do have an important tangible effect on people's lives. Um, and, uh, and the book overall shows that these debates 
And the whole enterprise of studying durable authoritarianism remains important, uh, remains something that we should be studying. And I think ends uh, in the conclusion, towards the end of the conclusion, makes a really valuable point uh, for this literature on persistent authoritarianism in the region, which is that we should stop looking for the single explanation for why authoritarianism appears to persist in the region. There is no single explanation, and this for me was sort of a eureka moment. I mean, it, it's a, it makes a lot of sense, and yet this literature seems to be so focused on oil, Islam, you know, some, some single variable that's going to be the magic variable that explains everything going on in the region. So, as you can tell, I'm quite enthusiastic about the book, and um, I look forward to hearing the comments from my colleagues. Howdy. Howdy. Uh, there we go. Thank you. One Aggie in the, in the room. <laughs> I teach at the Bush School at Texas A&M University, and we begin all formal events with a, with, a, with a good howdy. I guess you sophisticates here in Austin are, you know, you know don't have to do that. Um, <laughs> So I, I think that this is really a, a, a good book. Uh, it has some great points to it. I love the structural approach in the face of the very voluntaristic descriptions of the Arab Spring that we got. Almost every edited book on the Arab Spring is country by country. And what these guys are doing is, is, is trying to show it as a whole and, 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 and being able to set up interesting comparisons. I think that that's great. It's very parsimonious, which makes it a great teaching book. I think this is going to be the teaching book on the Arab Spring. Uh, it's, it's, as Melanie said, just fully grounded in the empirics, uh, which makes it uh, somewhat uh, different from some of the quickie things that came out on the, on the Arab Spring. And, and it suggests a lot of counterintuitive explanations, which, which I find really, really interesting. I love the state capacity stuff. Uh, Melanie works on, in, in this area as well. I think that, that, that state capacity is something that we, we, we need to focus on much more directly in explaining all sorts of outcomes in, in both comparative politics and IR of, of the region. Uh, I think that, that uh, one of the great questions that the Arab Spring brings up is why, after what I, I think is fairly clear evidence of decades of increased state capacity in the Arab world from the 50s through the, through the 90s, why is it that state capacity started to decline uh, in some places and maybe not in others? Uh, and and how, do we, how do we get a handle, especially historically, on, on how to, to measure, and I don't, I don't necessarily mean quantitatively, but how do we, how do we get a handle on, on changes in state capacity? Uh, and I think that the book uh, makes a, a, a really good first stab at, at bringing state, if you will, bringing state capacity back in as a really important factor in understanding outcomes in the region. Okay, so, so here are my quibbles uh, with, with the, the general arguments. Um, Oil, oil has been very good to me in my career, and uh, I don't want to downplay the role of oil in, in uh, the explanations for the differential results that, that the authors find. I think it's absolutely true. But is it oil, or is it the fact that the Arab Spring occurs after almost a decade of, of a substantial run-up in commodity prices? Uh, so in other words, uh, the Algerian regime in the late 1980s was an oil regime, but faced an enormous crisis because of the collapse of oil prices in the mid-80s. And one can argue, I think, very convincingly that the collapse of oil prices created a fiscal crisis for the Algerian state, which led to political reform, which led to civil war. Right. So Algeria was an oil state, right? It was an energy exporting state as much in the late 1980s as it was in 2010 and 2011. But the difference, I would argue, is that uh, because of 10 years of oil price run-ups, the Algerians had plenty of money in the bank, right? So is, it a fiscal, is, this, is this a question of, of the fiscal capacity of the state, the fiscal cushion of the state? Supplied by oil, undoubtedly, right? None of these other states had that fiscal cushion. The oil states had it, 
But they had it not just because they were oil states, but they had it because they were oil states in a period after 10 years of you know, enormous price increases in the and, and this brings up this brings us back to this whole question about the relationship of oil to regime outcomes, right? Which which uh, the authors have, uh, I think, did a very good job in, in in a very compressed way describing the debates about the effect the the, the debates in the, in the academy about the role of oil in regime outcomes these days. So uh, most of these debates aren't about regime security, right? Most of them are about democracy or economic growth outcomes. But I, I, there is some literature on, on regime security and oil. And I think that, that the problem in general with it is that it takes oil as a, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't factor in the fiscal element, that sometimes oil brings you a lot of money, and sometimes it doesn't bring you so much money. So uh, quibble number one. Quibble number two, uh, and, and this, was, this was raised in the first panel, is the international element. So we have the FERC. Right, the 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 the, the debt which which Jason accurately described in terms of the the kind of the theoretical construct of their book as the Deus ex machina, right, right. And maybe not Deus, but you know the 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 army ex machina that comes in from the outside, right, that gives you a different result in Libya which would not have been expected by certainly by the oil factor would be expected by by. Uh, uh, the lack of, of dynastic succession, right? Uh, Jason wrote a whole book about the international effects on domestic political results in Egypt. Amani wrote a whole book on the, the role of American democracy promotion and its uh, counterintuitive results in uh, American democracy promotion and lack of action on that in, 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 in the region. And, and, uh, and uh, so the international falls out of this book, right? The international falls out of this book. And, uh, and I don't have a place to put it back in, right? I don't have a place to put it back in, but I, I do think that it's worth thinking about. Was, now, it's, it's absolutely obvious that, that being an American ally wasn't you know, gonna save you, right? As Mr. Mubarak found out. But being an enemy of America was, was a bad thing in 2011. Being a friend might not have been a good thing, but being an enemy of America was a bad thing, as Mr. Gaddafi found out. But then you have to ask yourself, well, was Gaddafi really an enemy of the United States? I mean, the United States had been working with the Gaddafi regime in the, in the five years before the, actually post 9-11, Gaddafi, we, we actually did renditions to Libya of, of people who were captured. So uh, the international really is, I think, I would, like to, I would like to hear from the authors more about this. Now, I, I don't think that the Iraq War had anything to do with any of this. Uh, uh, some people who, who are Iranians and thus believe that the world revolves around Iran believe that the Green Movement in 2009 had an important kind of latent effect on this. I, I think that there's absolutely no evidence for that. But one international factor that is important here, and I think it would be very hard to deny, is that, this, the, that the Arab Spring did reassert the importance of, of Arab identity in the, political, in, the, in, in the political reactions of people in these states, right? The, the whole notion of Arab identity had fallen out of fashion after, after Tariq and I's favorite Middle Eastern figure, Gamal Abdel Nasser, uh, you know, left the scene. And, uh, but why is it that every single Arab country had some kind of reaction in these months, right? Some of them were, 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 were tiny and minor, but the elites of these countries did not find these reactions tiny and minor. They spent billions of dollars to keep those reactions tiny and minor. They didn't do that during the Green Revolution, right? During the Green Movement in 2009 in Iran, right? Millions of Iranians on the street in 2009 protesting a, a fraudulent election. People in the Arab world looked at it and said, eh, eh. But every single country in the Arab world affected by this, to differing degrees, undoubtedly, with differing results. 
But I do think that, that at least one international factor is this sense of Arab identity and what does it mean today? Right? It means something different today than it did in 1958. Right during the when 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 Egypt and Syria merged into a single state, and it was the high water mark of Arab nationalism. Arab identity means something different today, but it clearly means something. People in Tunisia, when they went out in the streets, yeah, plenty of them carried you know signs in French and all, and plenty of protesters all around the Arab world carried signs in English. They wanted to speak to the larger world, but when people in Tunisia went out in the street, they chanted a slogan that must have sounded funny to them as they were speaking it because they chanted a slogan that that shabiuri uh, nizam, right? Which is not the way in the local dialect of any Arab country you would express the idea that the people want the fall of the regime. They expressed it self-consciously. They expressed it in very formal kind of newspaper and television news Arabic so the rest of the Arab world would understand them. Right? I think that's an interesting element that we still haven't completely come to grips with. All right, and finally, my biggest quibble with the book is, is the dynastic succession variable. Uh, so it just can't be dynastic succession. It cannot be, dynastic succession cannot be right, a, 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 a variable that leads to regime security because if that were the case, Gaddafi would never have ruled in Libya Right? Because the monarchy would not have been overthrown. Right? Mubarak would never have ruled in Egypt because the monarchy would not have been overthrown. Right? The Hashemites would still be ruling in Iraq, and Ali Abdullah Saleh would never have ruled in Yemen because the Imam would never have been overthrown. Right? The Imamate of Yemen had an 800 year history of dynastic succession. Right? And yet it was overthrown in 1962, as the monarchy in Iraq was overthrown in 1958, as the monarchy in, in, uh, in Egypt was overthrown in 1952, as the monarchy in Libya was overthrown in 1969, as the monarchy in Tunisia. Tunisia was a monarchy upon independence, right? You can, go, you, you can Google the pictures of the bay. He looked even better than Bourguiba, right? Because his uniform was even more resplendent. Right, than Bourguiba's uniform. Uh, but Bourguiba showed the bay the door, right? Uh, the day, the bay is in Algiers, the day, the day of Tunis, right? Uh, so it can't just be dynastic succession. Monarchies have fallen all over the region, right? The Shah of Iran had a dynastic, you know, the Pahlavis had a dynastic succession, right? And yet the Shah fell in 1979, right? So it, it, there has to be something about Dynastic successions, and, and you guys, and this is one of the things I think you're going to get hit on the most in this book, is that you walk right up to the line of saying dynastic succession is in fact a variable, but other times you say it's an indicator of something else, like Melanie said, right? And, I, I, and that's, that's the point where I think you're going to get the biggest criticism in this book. But it's also the most counterintuitive point, so it's going to get a lot of attention, which is great. Uh, so what does dynastic succession mean? Well, it, it's a signal, as the book says, of, of military commitment, commitment of the coercive apparatus to the regime. But what underlies this, right? What underlies this? In the monarchies, right, in the existing monarchies, I think what underlies it is all of the things that basically, right, uh, keep an army loyal to any regime. Right? Habituation, uh, lack of alternatives, uh, uh, plenty of goodies from the regime, right? We don't, we don't ask why the French army doesn't overthrow the French government every day, right? And it has, of course, in the past. And it has, it, you know, in, in, in the living memory of some of you out here, it's even tried to overthrow the government in your, in your memory, right? The military coup attempt against de Gaulle in the early 60s over the Algerian issue. So why is it that the French army doesn't overthrow the government is not something we tend to think about much in political science, and, and I don't think we think about it much, we should think about it much and why the army doesn't try to overthrow the government in Jordan, or why it doesn't try to overthrow the government in Morocco these days, although it tries, it's had in the past, right? Okay, so why, so, so, why is it that in a case like Syria, 
the army sticks with the regime. Why was it in a case like Iraq that you needed a FERC to change the regime? In other words, why did the army stick with Saddam Hussein? Right? And it did, despite the huge defeats that, that his regime suffered. And I think that, that you know, it's not dynastic succession that is driving this. It's the fact that these armies were minority armies. And the link between the link between the military, the coercive apparatus, and the regime right, was a minority sectarian, in, in the case of Iraq and Syria, uh, sectarian identity, where the military believed that if the regime went, they would have no role in the future of that society, and in fact would most likely be killed. Right? That was certainly the case in Iraq. The, 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 right? the regime falls, and that army has no role in the rebuilding of that society. We, the United States of America, the geniuses of FERC, made sure of that. Right? We disbanded the army. I think that that, that that same dynamic is what explains why the Syrian army has stuck with, uh, or the elements of the Syrian army that are still in the field, has stuck with the Assad regime. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, I'll try to um, not repeat points that were made by my uh, colleagues, excellent points that were made by my colleagues. First of all, I want to say it's a great honor and privilege to be here. I uh, thank uh, Andy, Tarek, and Jason for inviting me. I thank also um, uh, everybody at, at EU Texas for organizing this. Um, it's been a really great privilege and honor to read the book. Um, and the book, is go the book is going to be a very important book. The book is going to be widely recognized as, as such. Um, it's probably the most, it is actually the most comprehensive and commanding and authoritative book on the Arab uprisings. Um, and it will be known as such. So I want to, again, there's a lot to applaud here. I want to congratulate the authors for assembling a wonderful uh, volume. A lot of us wouldn't even dare to try to uh, move into this territory to do this because as my colleagues have pointed out, these are moving targets. Uh, there's a lot going on in the region. There's too many variables. There's too many theoretical models uh, explaining this. And they try to make sense of a very unwieldy topic. They try to tame this beast, if you may, um, by tackling it both theoretically, empirically, um, and actually try to create a unified theory about all of this. this is th these are not easy things to do. So again, um, so I, I, I'm trying to imagine the type of conversations you had amongst yourself to come to this unified agreement on what the book would look like, and uh, I don't envy that. So, um, so congratulations again. So if you, if you uh, again, the, all of this is to say that you should read the book, you must read the book, um, and to get a good sense of the, the, the theoretical breadth of the book, the, the book first tackles this issue of authoritarian persistence as it relates to the Arab world and whether the Arab world is exceptional. Again, this is an important debate, one that we in the Middle East uh, political establishment, if you may, have argued against for some time, but nevertheless, it still is out there, so there is a need to argue against it. It also comes back and, and discusses some of the key theories that have been out there to explain authoritarian persistence, whether it's the rentier state, whether it's the structure of ideology, the structure of these countries, and they do a very nice job sort of debunking um, a lot of these, these arguments. And then they move to explain the Arab uprising, but even there, there's not basically one literature or one subtype of literature that they need to engage, they're engaging um, a whole, um, they're, they're engaging comparative politics in and of itself. They're engaging the literature on protests and revolutions, on transitions, on consolidation, on protest, um, on you know what, what constitutes a successful um, uh, transition. So again, this is all very um, ambitious and uh, very well done in such a short amount of space. So again, I want to commend the authors. Um, the empirical treatment of the cases is actually really well done as well. Um, and I, that's not an easy feat. To d condense it in basically one or two chapters um, and, and, and stay faithful to the argument, the argumentative thread that they want to unpack in the, in the book is also, is also very, very nicely done. So, um, and again, a lot of this material in these case studies from 2000 
2011 to 2014, it's not necessarily widely available or accessible. Um, this is not material that is at our fingertips. So again, it appears that the authors have worked really hard. Um, I'm sure there were a lot of research assistants also helping you at some level, or at least I hope. Um, but again, um, <laughs> again, it was really nicely done. Um, having said, ha said this, again, I think this book is going to be widely read. It will be on my syllabus for sure. Um, I'm sure it's going to be um, on, a, on a lot of syllabi across the country. Um, uh, but I do, I do have some questions. And it, it, it's really awkward for, I think, a panel um, discussing a book launch to have questions on a forthcoming book that's probably already in print um, or in, in press. But nevertheless, uh, we, we will talk a little bit about this. Um, oh, I also want to say in terms of, uh, and to echo both what Melanie and Greg said about not only the treatment of cases, but basically keeping that path-dependent argumentative thread from this historical institutional account was really well done in terms of the qualitative methods employed here. Um, it's a good example for our students to see good qualitative work come out on such a timely issue. Um, paying attention to sequence and periodization and things of that sort, so that's very nicely done. So. I think I have two overarching uh, questions, if you may, perhaps critiques of the book. Um, the first is I think that the book did a much better job telling us why the Arab Spring happened rather than tell us why did it happen when it did. So even if we buy into the dynastic succession, and I don't want to get into it with Greg, but I'm going to actually sort of echo some things that Greg said. It's not clear, and, 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 and Greg gave, a, and, and Melanie as well, gave, they gave great examples of cases where you had dynastic succession that led to regime change. What's not clear to me is that you've also had cases of stability and regime durability in the, non, uh, in the cases that are, are, are not hereditary um, where the militaries have sided with their regimes, right? So y y you look at Jamal Abdel Nasser, the relationship Jamal Abdel Nasser had with his military, it's only up until 2011 where the military quote unquote breaks ranks. So wh what is it about the, her the non-hereditary nature of the regime in 2011 that makes it more difficult for the military to, um, to align itself with the regime than, let's say, in the, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s um, in Egypt and elsewhere in the region. So that's, that's one of the first, the, the, the first critiques. Um, and I'm not sure that the book needs a theory, a temporal theory of why this happens. Now, I know you introduced this idea of technology um, um, in, in terms of motivating protest. I'm not entirely sure that that's, that's, that's I'm not entirely sure that whether you want to treat the impetus for protest separate from your argument about what leads to the changes that you see in terms of regime outcomes. So it's like you try to get some kind of exogeneity by saying, oh, well, you have technological change, but actually the structure itself might be, be, it might be altered during this time period, and that's not captured in the theory. Um, so that's the first critique. The second critique is, um, well, and it's sort of it's sort of related to this 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 first point, if you may, is that what I think you guys do right and I, is right on target is you've identified the key issue that that went wrong with the Arab uprisings or went wrong with the with with the regimes is that in some cases the military oppressed and in other cases it didn't, and this is the huge empirical puzzle. The truth is whether it's about dynastic hereditary succession or not, um, is it big issue? But I don't think it's the one that you should be criticized. Uh, I, I, at least I hope that people just don't pick up on this and say, oh, it's all about, heredit it's, it's not about hereditary succession. Because the key issue, which, which is the question you are asking, is why do we see the military oppressing or the military breaking, bre breaking rank with the regimes? And so then the key question then becomes what's going on with the, the military regime relationships? And there, I, I would have liked to see a much more deeper and, 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 and sort of uh, nuanced understanding of how the relationship of militaries with these Arab regimes 
forms from the beginning, the, the origins of that relationship. I think that's where the, the story is. This is a story that we have, it has come in our conversations, we've sort of pointed to it, but it has never been studied well in the context of the Arab world. Now again, you might not, you can't do everything in one volume. This is probably not what you wanted to do. You sort of found yourself with this key explanation. I think the easy way was to get it wrapped up in hereditary succession. The more difficult task was is to uh, unpack the relationship of these military to the regimes. That's where, not because Greg and I have written on this, so Greg, Greg is very humble, um, but Jason as well, that's where the role of foreign intervention I think is much more salient to your story than you'd like to, to, to believe. Because in the end of the day, um, I think Melanie's right that these, these are all cost benefit, sort of like strategic interactions. Um, and so the military is asking itself at some point, are we better off with the regime or without the regime? Right, and maybe the sectarianism is very important in terms of keeping the regime aligned with the with the dictators of the Ba'athist Party in Syria and Iraq. Um, but on the other hand, the military is also asking if this regime goes, if the, these leaders go, who will sustain us? And I believe Jason has written about this in his own book, where it, I think there was a widely held conviction among the Egyptian military that at some point without Mubarak, their ties to the United States would not be disrupted, or at least the, 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 the existence of the Egyptian military as we know it was going to remain intact during this transition, so Mubarak becomes all the more disposable. You see this, um, the same debates happen with, within Fatah, when Arafat is, 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 is sort of uh, marginalized. You you see this in other accounts. So this is sort of a strategic game between regimes and their militaries, um, where the militaries are are going to be worse off with a transition, they won't side with their militaries, which is what happens in Tunisia. I mean, quite honestly, I, I'm, not, I'm not a North African expert as such, so I'll, I'll concede to my colleagues here. I've never really heard much about the Tunisian military. It seems to be a rather incons inconsequential military in terms of the Arab militaries in the region. So the Arab, the, the military of Tunisia is probably thinking, if Ben Ali goes, what's going to happen to the role of the military? Let's pull out of this. We don't want to be involved in this game. Its weakness, in my opinion, is highlighted with the fact that even when there's this big, big blowout between Al Nahda and Nida Tunis, for example, we never, we never, it was not, it's not even remotely possible that the military is going to intervene in Tunisia and try to mediate between these two parties. Uh, it's almost inconsequential in that debate, and it's. I hate to say this, but in my interviews with members of Nidat Tunis uh, at the time, if they did have a military that would be able to reverse the democratic process and to kick Nahda out of power, there were many in Nidat Tunis who would have preferred that, who would have liked that. Um, so it's not that Nidat Tunis, Tunis had undergone some, you know, miraculous modernization project and they, they are now the, the pillars of plural, pluralism and tolerance in the Arab world, I think there wasn't an option to do that. Otherwise, after the, uh, the, the attack on the US embassy in Tunisia, in 12, 13, 2012, 2013, there was a lot of anger among the members of Nidat Tunis to do something about, uh, or they, at least they were blaming al Nahda, although Nahda never was really aligned uh, to the radical, th those radical movements. Um, so my last point and on that modernization leap that I didn't think was necessary in the book, but since you took it, then, then, you, get the, then you get into the point of a circular argument. Because in the countries where you are claiming, which is now only the poster child of Tunisia, where you're claiming there's a tolerant and vibrant pluralist civil society, it's also in the countries where you have weak militaries. And where you have strong militaries, you don't, you're arguing that there is weak civil society. So it can be that the same sources that have caused weak civil societies and strong militaries is another set of variables that you guys uh, haven't paid attention to in the argument. So, and, and, and then on the point of civil society, again, not to go back to Tariq's new book, where he basically argues there is a vibrant civil society in Egypt, but the Islamists have appropriated it. Um, and I don't think the argument there is that by default that it's become or rendered it more, uh, uh, have, have, have made civil society 
um, lack modernization or, or more intolerant, if you may. I don't think that's the argument you make in your, in your book. Um, so nevertheless, having said that, it's not an easy issue to really unpack this relationship of military to the regimes. Um, it's not fair to place that burden on, on Andy, Jason, and Tarek. Um, I think this is going to lead the way to a lot of new research and scholarship on this topic. It is, it's provoking a lot of conversation and discussion even amongst ourselves. So I want to congratulate you on a very fine book. Thank you very much. All right, so yeah, we want to move into discussion, which I, I suppose could begin either by collecting audience questions or by us saying a few words. Why don't we collect questions from the audience? And we'll then, give you guys the last word. Yeah, that's a good idea. Well, it's not bad. First, and, and I want to say thank you, Melanie, Greg, and Mandy, for, for coming here and, and being um, so thoughtful, but also pushing us on several important points. <laughs> All right, so I'll, I'll call on some people, and can you uh, identify yourself when you ask a question? So, yes. All uh, right, yeah. Yes, yes, you.
Could you comment a bit on uh, how you how you feel those Gulf monarchies uh, have responded to the Arab Spring? Yeah, let's take this one and then start answering some of these questions. Yeah. Okay, so uh, the first question on Gulf funding, and and then the second was on Islam and variations within Islam. You guys want to? Yeah. Let me. So I'll take a few of these, and then Tarek and Andy will take a few. Yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. So I'm going to speak to the question of the international factors, especially what, what Greg was, was asking for, and then the, the hereditary succession variable and other ways of us thinking about the relationship between the ruler and the military and security apparatus, um, including familial ties, as the, the last questioner um, pointed out. So on the, on the international component, you know, maybe it is that because some of us have have written on this so much that we didn't develop it at length in the book. But we do, we do say, it's kind of brief, it's just for a few pages, but we say, let's look at what the Arab autocracies have in common and how that differs from the autocracies that have fallen in other regions in recent decades. And what we, what we note is that compared to Latin America, let's say in the 1980s, or certainly compared to Eastern Europe in the 1980s. The, the Arab states in 2010, overall, and almost uniformly, constituted or represented unconstrained uh, security states. They were not facing significant international pressure um, when it came to the use of violence. And in fact, in many ways, they were encouraged by external powers, including the United States, to use violence and coercion against their opponents. So that's a very different international context than what a lot of comparativists, such as Stephen Levitsky and, and Luke and Wei in their recent book on competitive authoritarianism, have been dealing with. And we point that out to say, look, here's a background condition. Lots of coercion, lots of repression, much tougher regimes to crack than what activists in sub-Saharan Africa have faced recently, or what uh, Latin American opposition has faced. And we, we trace that to the, basically the US hegemony in the Persian Gulf and, and greater Middle East since the 1970s, and in particular after 1980 when, uh, when Jimmy Carter announced his doctrine. So, so there is an international component to, to this whole story. It's just that when it comes to explaining variation, and that's really what we're trying to do, why do you get authoritarian breakdown versus successful crackdowns. In explaining variation, the sort of security state variable is omnipresent. So that's not gonna give us any leverage. And instead, what we need to do is dig into those security states and see how they're operating. And 
And here we come to the, this issue of personalism and hereditary succession. And the, the comments that, um, that our discussants raised were very much on point and they're issues that I've, I've thought a great deal about. Um, I had an article a few years ago about sort of why does hereditary succession take place in non-monarchies to begin with? Uh, something that Melanie, uh, you know, a question she underscored in her remarks. And in, in that article I found kind of interesting institutional pattern in which ruling parties that, that were in charge of a succession in the past became the focal point for the next succession. Um, so for example, you know, China, we don't, see, there, we don't see hereditary succession in China. We don't see hereditary succession in Malaysia. Um, it's, it's in the cases where you don't have an institutionalized party process that leaders look to the, 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 sort of the heir apparent and, and hereditary succession as a way of stabilizing what could be a very volatile transition process. Um, so, so that's one, that's kind of one element of hereditary succession. But I think for, for understanding when you're gonna see a crackdown or when you're not, um, we, it, it will be worth looking further into hereditary succession. Um, certainly in the post-1980, post-Carter doctrine period, this hereditary succession variable I think does a, a decent job of separating when the military cracked down from when it uh, sided with the opposition. But I think we can look further. Uh, you know, we talk in studies of authoritarianism about peering into a, a black box, trying to see what's inside the black box. And for me, the study of authoritarianism often feels like a set of Matryoshka dolls. I mean, so I'll get to one variable that I think is really important, such as in my first book, Ruling Parties, and okay, that, that gets us somewhere in understanding what was going on with Mubarak. But now the ruling party is gone and it appears that what is really, good, and it'll be back in a couple of years, but what will have connected it and sort of sustained it is the security apparatus, security apparatus underneath. So in this book, we get into the security apparatus, taking off one more layer of this Matryoshka doll. And what we see underneath is the, the presence of family members um, in the security apparatus. And it's the presence of family members in Syria across the security apparatus that paves the way for the successful hereditary succession in 2000. And it's the absence of family members in the security apparatus in Egypt that would have made hereditary succession a much uh, tougher sell if it had reached that point. So I, I definitely take the point, it's kind of like an issue of infinite regress or piercing the next black box, that we can go further into this and really look at the extent to which the ruler, not just thinking of personalism as a vague variable of, in terms of you know, corruption and, and use of violence and brutality, but personalism in terms of the ruler's relationship to the course of apparatus and whether or not that apparatus, apparatus will stick with the incumbent when there's a popular revolt. So, so let, let, me, um, let me just first say, when I first went to graduate school, if you had told me that one day I'd co-author a book with Andy Reynolds, who's like the man on a political institution, and Jason Brown, who's the man on, on, uh, on, on Middle Eastern politics, and that the book would then be discussed by Amani Jamal, F. Gregory Gauss, and Melanie Cannon, I would have said, this is clearly some dream. And then if you had added that it was happening in Austin, Texas, where my favorite musicians are from, Guy Clark, et cetera, I would have just, go, I would have exploded. So uh, I, I'm deeply uh, grateful for uh, that this happened. So I just want to say two things. I first want to know that Greg's question is the key question, right? Greg is stuck a dagger in the heart of the project. But I think we can withstand it, right? Greg is saying, Hereditary succession, succession cannot be the cause of regime durability because, as he notes, the, the history of the Middle East is littered with hereditary regimes that have fallen. And we do address this in the pages of the book. And we do note that those earlier hereditary regimes were, of course, shored up by colonial power and its own colonial power. So, so that's one. So the point is, these regimes that are today in the 21st century continuing to have hereditary, they're fundamentally different than the ones that, that fell earlier. The other point is that 
I think as is clear from Jason's remarks, hereditary succession is our indicator of a deeper underlying variable that we're calling personalism, right? Which signals this uh, tight uh, uh, bond between the agents of the coerced apparatus and the uh, regime. So I, but I do want to know what that is. Greg has, you know, clearly nailed it. Um, and then he makes clear something, he makes it clear that we didn't make something clear enough, right? So we do not at all subscribe to the notion that the Tunisians were more pluralistic in the, normatively, right? So when we use the word pluralism, people often think we're talking normatively, right? That the Tunisians believed in this idea that society has to have these different groups. That the, we're talking about pluralism as an empirical fact. In other words, balance of power. So forget about, you know, the idea that there are multiple different power centers, there are multiple different um, uh, political actors who are of significant weight electorally. And Tunisia had it, and Egypt did it. And we then need to explain that. We can't just say that, you know, this is the way the landscape was. In fact, there's literature already out there saying endogenizing that to electoral institutions. We say it's not electoral institutions, it is these developmental factors. And that's why we bring in modernization theory. And we're extremely explicit because modernization theory has two pillars or two branches. One that says that it leads to democracy uh, through processes that deal with individual cognition. People become smarter and more educated. More. We say no. We don't buy that, but it does have this other, more organizational component, which is simply that it, you know, you tend to have, you know, have economic development, you get industrialization, you get labor unions. This is an independent basis for political organizing that can serve as a counterweight to religious, traditional bases of organizing, and that, and that's actually consistent with the argument I tried to make in the other book. So, but I just really. I'm grateful to you for like highlighting that because we do not want to say that you know the Tunisians just believed in pluralism and it's uh, and it's because they were more modern. We want to say that you know non-Islamists had more resources, more electoral resources. And of course, we don't want to make the mistake of of um, of equating the non-Islamists with this particular political party that's emerged uh, recently as the uh, the plurality. We that too, this, right? The non-Islamists sector in Tunisia is a lot more than just uh, the that Tunis, and that's important as well. So I'll stop there, but I will stop by saying thank you again for these great comments. It was really, really wonderful. No, and actually, I'd like to hear the discussants' reactions to some of these questions. Yeah. You have that, so thank you. So we have, getting back to the audience's questions, we have the question about the Gulf powers intervening. Um, authoritarian personality and how much of a role that played, uh, Iran and the Green Movement, and whether or not the Muslim Brotherhood could put a majority together. Morsi, could he, have, could he have governed, let's do that one first, could he have governed in a way to avoid the coup? Yeah, could Morsi have governed in a way to avoid the coup? Uh, so, that, that, you know, so it seems to me that Morsi uh, Hamid Morsi, guy gets elected president of Egypt in uh, in May of 20, uh, in June of 2012. Uh, it seems to me that he was trying to put together a majority coalition. But what he thought the coalition you needed was between the Muslim Brotherhood and the army. Okay, so he makes a lot of concessions to the military. Uh, and in fact, if you look for continuity between the constitution that the Muslim Brotherhood put in place and the constitution that the uh, military dominated the government put in place, the uh, commonalities are all about the role of the military is first among equals, and et cetera. So, you know, clearly, right, so the argument is, well, Morsi was, was compromising with the wrong group, right? So instead of compromising with the military, given because the military were just going to defect from him, he should have been compromising with the uh, liberals, right? Um, but if you look at what lots of quote unquote liberals were asking Morsi to do, right? They were asking for things that would have actually been, you know, opposed to the military. Um, so I think I think there was there was really no way that he could have threaded this needle. And I, I would also say this that let's say that Morsi had succeeded and the Muslim Brotherhood had succeeded. I still don't think that Egypt would be a democracy, right? I think that fundamentally the choice between Egypt was between a one-party dictatorship of the Muslim Brotherhood 
and put and, and a coup against that one party dictatorship to put in a different kind of dictatorship in play. But fundamentally, democracy is made. If we, if you buy the argument where democracy is really made possible by this, you know, e sufficiently even balance of power, to use uh, Walter Lippmann's term, that didn't exist in the Egyptian case. So, you know, the choice we had in Egypt was really between different authoritarianisms. Uh, one electorally validated, one, as you saw, you know, uh, uh, I'm thinking about it a little bit. But I don't think that, you know, in terms of our coding of the Egyptian case in any of our data sets, it wouldn't have been terribly good. On the question of Iran, I would say, I mean, one of the, I, I would say first that the 2009 Green, green Movement had um, a relatively limited geographical scope in terms of the extent to which protests spread, um, and that the cohesiveness of the of the course of apparatus in Iran, you know, helps to explain why that and other movements haven't uh, haven't made more uh, more progress. Um, I've been to Iran just once uh, for a few months in 2002, and one of the things that struck me uh, from speaking with people there is, you know, having and this may bear upon you know why we don't see more uprisings in in Algeria or other places. Having been through a traumatic upheaval once, Iranians, including those who support the opposition, are very cognizant of the, the uncertainty, the kind of radical uncertainty and open-endedness that a revolution can bring about. And so they are betting, generally speaking, they're betting on gradual change, sort of that the leadership will become more enlightened over time. And obviously, uh, over the short term, that, that does not seem to be paying off. But I think a large um, number of Iranians favor that to some type of more volatile um, confrontation or radical confrontation. And OK, uh, David, your question about the authoritarian personality, I mean, I, I, I would definitely see, I think one thing that we've underestimated in comparative politics is that people can uh, genuinely support authoritarian leaders. I think Putin has some genuine popularity. I think. You know, uh, among his constituents, Bashar al-Assad has genuine popularity. I'm in my undergrad class this afternoon. I'm screening a frontline documentary about the Syrian civil war, and you know they have footage of school children and others who uh, probably Alawi who are expressing their support for Assad. And I don't think, you know, it it could be framed in terms of the old kind of authoritarianism personality literature, authoritarian personality literature. But I don't think it's, it's like a Milgram experiment necessarily uh, psych psychology here. I think it's more about people looking at their material circumstances and making a calculation about what's going to be best for themselves and their families. And, and I think that's one thing that the Arab uprisings have really crystallized for us is for us as scholars to better appreciate the complexity of those calculations as people are, are weighing them in real time. And OK, Gulf Cooperation Council and intervention. Um, we did get some questions early on in the project um, about whether Bahrain was the opposite of a FERC, where, whether it was foreign posed regime continuity, and whether the Saudis you know, really still be a FERC. Still an FIRC. <laughs> <laughs> whether, you know, so I think someone said foreign imposed regime durability, durability. FERD. You know, um, so, we, we basically say that, I mean, in terms of what we've, we've read and what we cite, it was Bahraini forces that suppressed the uprisings. The Gulf Co Cooperation Council was there as sort of backup, as a reserve. But it, but, um, so it's kind of over, what we're saying is kind of, it was overkill, like for the Saudis to arrive. The, the Bahraini uh, security agencies had enough repressive capacity themselves, and once they've demonstrated that they're going to be loyal to the monarchy, then you know, the uprising is over in a crackdown. And then, of course, the GCC role in, in the Libyan intervention, um, I mean, I don't think was, was decisive. I think if NATO had been doing it by itself, that would have probably led to the same outcome. But it was uh, symbolically important. Yeah, I, I think this, and this gets to uh, a question that Amani asked as well. I think the, the role of outside actors in terms of influencing the behavior of the military is really important, and I think Gulf funders 
Uh, you know, so for example, the you know the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia are very supportive of the current Sisi regime in Egypt. And you can imagine an alternative future in which you know the Egyptian economy continues to tank. People go out into the streets, and the Egyptian military has to make a decision vis-a-vis Sisi, much like they had to make with Mubarak or Morsi. Do we back this guy or do we not? And you could easily see the Gulf countries trying to push the military to back the leader. Um, and, and, so, and, and I think, in fact, you know, this probably happened in February 2011 when Mub- the military was trying to decide whether to overthrow Mubarak. I mean, it is highly, and Greg, maybe you have some inside details on this, it's highly probable to me that the Gulf countries said to the Egyptian military, stay with Mubarak and we're going to shower you with resources. But I think the military still decides to defect, and I think that just indicates the privacy of domestic factors. And so later, when, and this, this, this would be, and many of I may have a disagreement about this, but, uh, and I never like to disagree with them any because I'm always wrong. Um, but, uh, you know, when, when the Egyptian military decides to overthrow Morsi, was the balance of US pressure on the military to get the, the I would say, this is why you're looking at me funny, I would say the US military, the US would have, was trying to get the Egyptian military not to overthrow Morsi. I think a man would have evidence for saying that the Egyptian, the US military, the US was saying the Egyptian military go right ahead, it's fine. Um, but I think, I, I think. Well, we know that, the, that Saudi Arabia was saying overthrow. We're knows that Saudi Arabia was saying overthrow. Yeah. But my point is, well, let's say the United States, let's just think the counterfactual, let's say the United States says to Egypt, don't overthrow Morsi. I still think they overthrow Morsi. You know, I still think that, you know, the Egyptian military made this calculation about how bad the MV was and that it didn't matter what, what, what the U.S. said. Just like yes. they made a calculation about how untenable Mubarak was and it didn't matter that the Gulf said keep Mubarak in. They, the primacy of domestic factors, I think, is, is, uh, is important here. There was one other point that uh, we were talking about. Um, but I, I, I've lost, so I'll learn to shut up. <laughs> okay, well, thank you all for coming. We're going to have to close here.